are going to be having children's church and nursery starting uh, next Sunday. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of some of the guidelines that we're going to be having. Uh, first of all, the kids are going to have to wear a mask unless they're under two years old. Those are the guidelines, the protocol. Well, I don't know about that. Well, they have to anyhow in the preschools and school, so it's not like they're not used to that, okay? Um, when they go in the back, somebody will be taking their temperature. We have a, a touchless thermometer, uh, so if they are fevered, they're not going back. <laughs> if they're fevered, we'll be talking to you and telling you you shouldn't be here. So, uh, so if the kids are sick, don't bring them to church, okay? If you're sick, I think everybody knows that now. We live in a world now where this is, uh, even if you want to be here, you can come back next week, okay? So uh, it's just that we have to be cautious for everyone, okay? Um, when they're in the back with Children's Church, they're going to have their own personal uh, plastic uh, pencil box with their own stuff in it from now on, and that can be wiped off later uh, with disinfectant and so forth. So this is all part of what's going on in the nursery uh, only one parent with a child if you're going to go back there not two and uh, it has to be ages three and under in the nursery children's church is four through third grade and they're going to have to stick with that uh, if they're younger uh, than four that causes the teacher only to focus on one child versus keeping track of all of the children who are back there making sure the social distancing thing goes and everything. So we're having to adjust. Uh, we have to adjust to the new realities. And, you know, we I mean, that's just the way it is. And those are, you know, and somebody said, well, the government's telling you that. Well, now it's not just the government, it's our insurance company. So uh, that's the reality. That's what we have to live with. That's what we have to do. And we're going to adjust to that. We're just asking you to be patient with us and to help us adjust as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> just let you know, the uh, midweek, uh, well, I'm calling it the midweek, but the Bible studies during the week on Tuesday at 1030, uh, Wednesday at 7 o'clock uh, here is going to be, I think, up to lesson 5 this week, okay? or might be even lesson 6. Uh, is it 5? I think it's 5. Yeah, I think it's 5. Okay, I just had a brain freeze. That happens as you get older, okay? Uh, so it's lesson five, 10.30 on uh, Tuesdays in the morning. And uh, you say, well, George, I'd like to get involved, but I've missed four of the studies already. The way the studies are, you can show up at any time and uh, take part in the questions and so forth. If you are needing a book, we have the books right down here. There are three copies left right here in the corner section here. We encourage you to pick one of those up, okay? All right, so just a reminder, when we sing, we need to wear our masks, and uh, you can take them off otherwise. Uh, so let's stand together as they uh, lead us in worship this morning, okay? So over. 
moment and think about what uh, you just sang for a moment. It, it talked about being overwhelmed by the goodness of God in your life. Have you ever been overwhelmed like that? When God kind of reaches out at that right moment and answers you? Or even when you didn't even ask. He was there and he provided the strength and the wisdom and the guidance. A lot of times we maybe even take that for granted. I know I do. But I think what we need to do is just pause and be overwhelmed that the God of the universe loves us, that he cares for us. And I think that's an awesome thing for us to think about and reflect on that song as we sing. So let's, let's continue in worship. Let the worship band lead us in another one. Let's pray. Let's sing. Excuse me. I want you to, I was thinking as we were singing that song, I was actually kind of uh, depressed as we were singing that song. You know, a lot of us, we're, we're so thankful for the forgiveness of our sins. And I think if we think for a moment, it doesn't take us long to think about what our sins are. They're actually the things that constantly overwhelm us because we're defeated by them. And we're thankful for forgiveness. But then that's it. 
And I, I would like us, when we sang a song like what we just sang, I would like us to go one step further because that's really what the song is calling you to, is one step further. To think about the one who would be willing to forgive you. And think about the love that he has for you. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I think sometimes we give God a bad rap. You know, we think he's ready to squash us, to punish us for our sin. And that's true if you're not a believer. Do you understand? Everybody has to give an account to him. And if you're not a believer, that's a fearful thing. But the reality is, if you know Jesus and you put your life in his hands and you've committed to follow him, you don't need to see it that way. You actually need to see it not just that, oh, I'm forgiven and I've got heaven later on. You need to see the one and the love of the one who gave you that forgiveness and who gave you that eternal life. And that's how he is with you, period. Do you understand? Acting as a loving father. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and think about that. So, you know, like I'm a dad. And... Am I always happy with the things my kids do? No. Okay. But does that change my love towards them? No. Shouldn't, should it? And does that change that I'd be doing whatever I want to do, need to do for my kids to help them? To guide them, to direct them. Yes, I might need to discipline them. But did you understand? That's that's how we need to see the Heavenly Father. And I think when we sing a song like that, it's easy to forget the reality of who God is in our lives. Who He now is because of salvation. Did you understand what I'm saying? Because here's the thing. Do you sin? Yeah. Are you going to sin? But what does he tell us? We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. That's the relationship you have with Jesus. So let's quit living in defeat and let's pick ourselves up and go on because he is the one who is molding you and he is the one who will give you the victory. And so move on. Yes, your sin is devastating and it hurts the relationship with him. But the wonderful thing is, is that he will work with you to overcome it. Okay? Something to think about. Now, let me give you some verses for this week. It'll be up on your screen. Uh, we're going to look at James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. These are the verses that I want you to write down somewhere. Uh, they'll be in the newsletter. If you get the newsletter either by email or by mail. And these are the verses for you this week. It kind of reflects on what, about what we're going to talk about today in our message. But this is something for you to grasp a hold of as far as you living your life this week. James Chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. James writes, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, did you notice how many times he was telling you in those verses to be patient? Be patient about what, George? Be patient about all this stuff that's happening around you. A lot of it you have no control over, right? Look, I mean, I, honestly, if I talk to people today and they look at the craziness that's happening today because of the election, I'm pretty sure that most of us would say, can the chaos please stop? I would like to turn it off. We would all be like that, right? But do you have any control over it? No. Just like you don't have any control about whether or not the sun shines or it rains. So therefore, you be patient. And you find your rest in who? Christ. 
Do you understand? And we're going to talk about that in the morning message. So these are the verses I want you to think on, meditate on, sleep on, do whatever, write them on a card this week, and let them help guide you through James chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray uh, for somebody special uh, for us here at our church. Uh, it's Kenny Rischel. Um, I talked to Joanne a few days ago, and uh, Kenny has not eaten in over 30 days, okay? And so he's lost 50 pounds. Uh, they're not sure why he's not eating. He's getting tested a lot. He says he, he can't, he, it's hard for him to swallow. He chokes and everything. And so, of course, you know that this would be a burden on Joanne and because uh, she's taking care of him. He's drinking very little. The doctors feel that he's getting something because he's obviously getting protein from somewhere. And uh, so this, this is a concern for the Rishals, and uh, that would be a concern for us because we all love Kenny here. So when we pray, I want us to lift up Kenny as well, okay? And, of course, we want to pray for those in our church who are not able to be here to be a part of the church gathering. And some of them, we understand that uh, because this is uh, a very real thing that's out there. I mean, we've all heard even this week others who are contracting this. And if you have an underlying issue, a heart issue, a breathing issue, which we have folks in our church that have those issues, um, you know, that, that's a very real concern, and they have to be careful, and that's why they're not here. So we need to pray for them as well, okay? So let's look to the Lord in prayer, and of course we want to pray for our nation okay during these days that are ahead and uh, we're not sure about that so let's pray lord we love you and we thank you for your love for us and your goodness lord you you say in your word that you know what we have need of even before we pray but you still want to hear from us you still want to interact with us You still want to know what's on our hearts. And you know, Father, that there are a lot of things on our hearts, a lot of things that we're facing, struggles that we don't even know what to do with or how to handle it, and that we need you. And so, Father, some have come into this place this morning overwhelmed, wondering how they're going to make it through. Some are facing something this week that they don't even know what's coming. Help them to face it. We all need you. And so that's why we're here. To connect with other believers who love you as we love you. To encourage each other. To pray for each other. And that's why we're here, Lord. We want to pray for Kenny Rischel this morning. Lord, you know we love Kenny, and uh, he has been a blessing to our church all these years. And Lord, uh, we are troubled uh, by the news of what's happening with his health. God, I pray you would be gracious. Be gracious to Kenny and to Joanne and uh, give the doctors wisdom. Father, help them to realize what's going on and Lord, he needs, to, uh, he needs to start eating again. And only you can do that. Would you do that, Lord? Would you bring healing to his body? Whatever the issue is that's keeping him from eating with his throat or his sinuses, God, I ask that you would undertake. Father, I, I pray for just Kenny and Joanne this morning. Pray for others in our church that that are struggling with issues. I know we have several in our church that are struggling with COPD. Lord, we're getting into that uh, fall season with the leaves and, of course, allergies. And, of course, Lord, flu season's coming up. But not even with that, we have this thing with the COVID that is happening around us. And, Lord, thankfully, we live in an area where that is not as prevalent, but it's there. Lord, I pray for our vulnerable ones here in our church you would watch over and protect them give them grace through this be with them 
be, be with us in general, Lord, as we try to navigate these times, as we try to figure out what we need to do and what we, what we don't need to do. And, and Lord, even as a church, we've had to adjust and life is not normal. It's not the same anymore. Lord, that's frustrating. Help us to be patient. Help us to know how to navigate these times. Lord, I, I do pray for, for some in our church that are healing from surgeries. I think of Dottie Redden, Lord, who had knee replacement. I just pray you would continue to raise her up, continue to strengthen her, and continue to help her as she adjusts with that. Lord, we need you in our nation. These are troubled times. The solution ultimately isn't with any party, it's with you. Would you bring healing to our nation? Lord, and help us. Help us to recognize your sovereignty. As we enter into an election, I mean, things are so inflamed. Lord, help us even here as a church. Thank, thankfully, Lord, that we have not, we've not chosen to focus on that. We've chosen to focus on you. But, but we do recognize we need your grace in our nation. Lord, would you be merciful to us? Bring about healing. I pray that, Father. Your will be done. Lord, I also pray and ask, Lord Jesus, for our, for our world as it, it is in upheaval and with wars and pestilence and plagues. And God, help us to see the times that they are and help us to know how to live our lives in light of that. Father, there are many other needs here this morning. You know what they are. You know what the cries are from the hearts that are here. Lord, would you give them peace to let them know that you hear them? You don't promise to take away the problem. You don't promise to solve it. But you do promise to give grace, strength, and wisdom. And I pray that you would do that. Thank you for your grace in our lives and your love. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I want you to turn in your Bibles in the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're actually going to be um, working on the final two sections here. We've got this week and next week, and we'll be done with this series I've been really praying about what we're going to do after this, and what we're going to do after this is we're going to go to um, the Gospel of John, and we're going to focus on um, chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. That's the upper room discourse. Now, there's a lot there, uh, so don't worry, we're not going to go through all of it. But I do want to focus on one section of that, uh, and and. And I've entitled uh, what that series is going to be is You're Not Alone. And we're going to focus on the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Jesus gives us a lot of information about another comforter. The King James is the one who mentioned it as comforter. New King James says the same thing. Uh, if you're using an NIV or some other translations, it'll say helper. Uh, the word is parakletos in the Greek, meaning one who comes alongside of. That's the one who comes alongside of you as you're going about this life because Jesus isn't here. And a lot of us have no clue about that. And that's what we're going to focus on when we get done with this series in 2 Thessalonians. And I hope you will be, your eyes will be opened from the scripture about someone who is with you always, and that's the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot there, and we're going to look at that as we go along through the Upper Room Discourse. But today, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now, I want to remind you what we've been doing with this series. We've been looking at how to have peace in the coming storm. And I'm not just talking about the chaos that's happening in our world right now. There is a storm that is coming. You believe in Jesus. And because you believe in Jesus, you have, I hate to say it, you have a target on you. 
You have a target on you because this world doesn't love Jesus. This world doesn't care for Jesus. This world has a misconception of who he is and what he wants. This world rejects him. Why do they do that? It's because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And so they're not going to look favorably on you in this world, and you need to know how to live in this kind of world, to have peace in this kind of world. And and we've spent, really, the last 18 weeks looking at it through 1 Thessalonians and now through 2 Thessalonians. And so now he's going to wrap it up. And he's going to talk today about you enduring the chaos. That was something that they needed to do in their time because they were facing the persecution They were being imprisoned. They were being stoned. They were being mocked and ridiculed outright, so much so that Paul and his companions had to leave Thessalonica to go somewhere else for their own safety and leave the believers there by themselves to fend for themselves with the Spirit's help. So the question then is, is how do we endure? Because I'll be honest with you folks, There is no promise of peace in this world. Do you understand me? You and I can plan all we want about how everything is going to be wonderful. If we just achieve this, then if we do this, and if I build the right nest egg, and and everything, and we can have in our mind that everything's going to be wonderful, but have you lived long enough to realize, I hope you have, It doesn't go that way. You can plan out everything and someone will throw a monkey wrench into the situation. Things change continually. And you're like, how do I deal with this? How do I cope with this? Because this is the world we live in. But a lot of us don't choose to live in the real world, but we need to. And when you do, he tells you how to live there. And this is one of those passages. So I want you to notice with me, we're going to look at verses 1 to 5 today. We'll look at the rest of the chapter next week. Okay, Look with me at verses 1 to 5. It'll be up on your screen. You can tell that he's getting to his conclusion because he begins with one word, finally. Okay, That's kind of like a preacher saying, in conclusion, but you know there's at least another 15 minutes, right? Okay, Paul's the same way. He's got a lot of things he wants to share here in the closing section. Look at what he says. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it was with you and that you may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have the faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. For we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Now, there's a lot here in those, these five verses. In fact, I'm going to kind of divide them into three sections for you. We're going to look in verses 1 to 2 about a focus. He wants them to focus their prayers. And this kind of is kind of helping us to focus what we need to do, okay? And then he's going to tell you something about confidence, which, I'll be honest with you, we kind of need to know that. Why? Because, look, one of the things that you're going to lack when it's all breaking loose around you is confidence, isn't it? Because we're kind of living in fear, not confidence. So he's going to talk about what we can be confident in, and I'll tell you who we can be confident in. I'll give you a hint. God, right? That's where your confidence needs to be. But he's going to talk about confidence, and then we're going to look at what the growth areas are in your life where you need to be growing. Because you can still grow in the midst of what's going on around you. Okay? You can still grow. So let's talk, first of all, about a focus. Notice the first thing he says that they should be praying for. Look at what it says there, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord 
may run swiftly and be glorified just as it was with you. Now here's the first thing. Pray that the message of the gospel would flourish. Now, if you were like me, and you're self-focused like me, and you got life turning upside down around you, and chaos is in the world, and, and you're trying to figure out how to navigate this, my initial thought is, well, that's not really the first thing that I would be praying about. That's just selfishness on my part. I would be praying about, God, protect me. God, provide for me. God, watch over me. God, give me wisdom. God, bring peace. But that's selfishness, right? Look at what he's praying, because he recognizes in a world that's in chaos, they need to hear a message. And what they need to hear a message of is the gospel. What's the gospel? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for them. The forgiveness and the love of Christ. The new life that they have in Christ that they can escape from in this world. The relationship that they can enter in that will guide them through the craziness that they're going on. And he wants that message to be shared so that they, that message will be glorified in their lives. Now, because he said it's been glorified in their lives. And I would say it's been glorified in your lives. How? You give glory to God. You just did it through the singing because he saved you. He forgave you. He gave you a new life and a new outlook on life. Therefore, Jesus is glorified in your life. And so he wants that to be true of all the others that are in the world around you, that they would glorify Jesus too when they understand who he is and what he's done for them. That's his focus here. His first thing to focus on is that the message of the gospel would be prayed. Now he comes to the second thing, which we can all relate to. Okay? This is because we put this one first. He didn't. He put it second. Here's what it is. Pray for protection from unbelievers. Well, you know, George, yeah, I understand that, but I don't live in some parts of the world where I really need to fear that. Really? Look at how he refers to them here, okay? He says, verse 2, and that we may be delivered from, look at these two words, unreasonable and wicked man. Now, have you ever met anybody like that? You ever had dealings with anybody like that? Have you ever suffered at the hands of anybody like that? I see a lot of smiles here because you're like, yeah, I can think about somebody this week. Then he says, for not all have the faith. You're enduring right now, folks. It may not be outright persecution, being thrown in jail, somebody shutting down the service. But you're enduring at the hands of unbelievers right now because they don't know who? Jesus. And so here's what he's asking for us to do. He's asking for, us, for the message to go out, but then also asking, God, protect us. Now, I think it's interesting because a lot of times, you know, we'll say, okay, let's go to pray, pray about something, and we'll say, you know, I don't really know what to pray about today. That really reveals a lot about you and me when we say that because the fact of the matter is, if we gave it a little bit of thought, we would know exactly how to pray. God, protect me from unreasonable and wicked men. Because the day doesn't go by that you don't meet them, right? God, may your gospel go out to people because they need to know and meet who? Jesus. See, this is the focus that needs to happen. We need to get our focus back. Because here's what happens. when you're I know I'm like this. 
God knew who I needed to marry, okay? Because when I, when I get sick or when I'm hurting, the selfish part of me wants to be someone doting on me. Oh, I'm hurting. Okay? But he didn't give me a woman like that. <laughs> she doesn't put up with that. Did you know what I'm saying? She's like, what's the matter with you? I don't need to go any further. You guys can understand that, right? Why did I get off on that? Oh, okay. When we go through it, we kind of are like that. Oh, God, I need you. Wake up. People need Jesus. And ask me to protect you. That's what he's telling us. There's things to do. The world's going crazy. Yes. Wake up. People need Jesus. Ask me to protect you. That's what he's saying here. Get our focus back where it needs to be. And then... He tells you that you and I can have confidence. Because the fact of the matter is, is when it's blowing up around you, and it's blowing up, folks, yes, it's blowing up, and that doesn't include what's going on in your life. That's just looking at what the news is saying. But if you look at what's going on in your life, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Can I go another day? Can I handle this? What more can I do? Oh. And, and it's fear, fear, fear. Man, fear is big in our lives. But God's not the author of fear. If anything, he's given you something to be confident in, and that's who? Jesus. Look at what he says in verses 3 to 4. And then we're going to take this apart. There's several things I want you to see here that are so important. Look at what he says here. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you will do and will do the things we command you. All right, so here's four things. Four things about confidence. The basis for the confidence is the faithfulness of the Lord. All right, so here you are. You're in the midst of it. It's crazy and stuff's going on in your life and you don't know what to do and you're ruled by fear and you can have confidence. Why? Not because of you. Not because of you. Not because of me. But because of the Lord. Because over and over, just like in this passage, He is faithful. He is faithful. I mean, think about it for a moment. Okay, we did this in Sunday school. We just wrapped up this series. We started a new series today. Think about David, okay? David, when he was running from Saul, running from his enemies, and, 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 and he, life is really falling apart in David's life, okay? But if you go to the Psalms and you read the Psalms that he wrote during that time, what you will see in those Psalms is praising God for his faithfulness. You were there, Lord. You watched over me. You provided for me. You strengthened me. You took care of my enemies. You got me through that. I mean, I think about that for a moment. All right, folks, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 54 now, okay? So when you're 54, you got a lot of things to think about just in your own terms of years, okay? And I think back through the years, it, it's, it's almost like, man, I can't believe that happened, but I got through it. Man, I can't believe that happened, but I got through it. Man, I, wasn't that a terrible time, but we got through it. Isn't that true? If you reflect back on your life, oh, that was terrible, but I got through it. Who got you through it? Wasn't you. You were ready to throw in the towel. Some of you did throw in the towel, but he still got you through it. Why? Because your Lord is what? Faithful. 
And there's no guaranteeing that you're going to be like, oh, I can handle this next time something comes because I got the Lord. No, no, you're going to be like before. Ah! But he still will be what? Faithful. Isn't that awesome about God? He knows we're going to lose it. Pull our hair out. You can tell I've had a lot of things going on. Okay? And he's still faithful. Faithful. Okay? Here's the second thing. The Lord will establish you in your faith. Listen, a lot of teaching is out there today that says the reason why you're not healthy, the reason why God's not blessing you is because you don't have enough faith. You know what? That is a bunch of baloney. I'm going to tell you why. Because that teaching emphasizes that you are the one who has to establish your faith. You are the one who has to increase your faith. You are the one, you are the one, you are the one. That is baloney because when it comes to the fact of your relationship with Jesus Christ, did your relationship start out with him because of you anyhow? No, it started out with him because of what Jesus did for you. Did he save you because there was anything that you did or didn't do? No, he saved you because of what Jesus did. The only thing that happened from you is that you had to put your faith and trust in him, right? You had to reach out to him when he offered something to you. Now, the wonderful thing is the scripture tells you over and over and over, he who has begun a good work will be faithful to what? Complete it in you. Here he's saying, you can have confidence because the Lord is faithful. Look at what verse 3 says. Who will establish you? He'll establish you in your faith. He's establishing you in your faith. Listen, folks, that's why he allows the difficult things to come in your life. Because he uses those things to establish you in your faith in him. He establishes you. You can have confidence in that. The, the, the fact of you one day appearing before him and he looks at you and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my rest. And he crowns you with the crowns and he rewards you with the rewards. It's not going to be because of you, folks, because you know <laughs> we mess up. It's going to be because of the work he did in your life. And you will glorify him because of that. You know, do you know what I mean? He establishes you in your faith. That's the confidence you have. Here's the second confidence you can have. The Lord will guard you from the evil one. It's interesting in the Lord's Prayer, whether it's in Matthew or the version that's shared with us in Luke, that's one of the things that we are to pray for is protection from the evil one, isn't it? But then you come here to to 2 Thessalonians, and he just flat out tells you that you can have confidence that he does that. What? Look at what he says. I keep looking at chapter 2. Chapter 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish and guard you from the evil one. See, God is faithful in guarding you. You can have confidence but I know how we are. Happened to me the other day. So we're, we're doing some renovations in the back and everything. So I was here before the guys showed up one day. And, uh, and I'm going back and I'm turning the lights on, making sure the doors are open so that the heat flows through the building good enough and, and I hear a noise. <coughs> What's that? One too many horror flicks when I was a teenager. What's that? I've traced the sound to the nursery, to the toy box. And they have a toy in there that if it wiggles a little bit, and my heavy frame walking through the building wiggled the building enough to... And, it, it, and what am I saying? Because we lack confidence. We're afraid. And that's what happens with us. We're afraid of the enemy, aren't we? We need to be. He's tough, but you don't need to be. 
because the Lord is faithful. Paul says here he is faithful. He will establish you in your faith and he will what? Protect you from the evil one. You don't need to be freaked out. Don't need to be freaked out, folks. I'll, I'll, never, I'll, I'll never forget it. I, you know, back about 10 years ago, oh, it's been more than that now. It's been t- probably 12, 15 years ago, you know, I had the opportunity to go do teaching in Haiti, okay? And we know of Haiti as a dark place, right, because of the voodoo and everything. And, and I remember being there, and I was with our, with our host, who was the head of this uh, group of Baptist churches in the northern part of Kenya. And so I just asked him, I said, do you fear the voodoo? Do you fear this stuff that the people fear? Because they do fear it down there. The Haitians do fear it. It's real to them. And I said to him, do you fear it? He said, no, Christians don't fear that. We have no concern about that. You're not concerned about curses? Nope. Why? Because the Spirit lives within us. And no one can touch us except the Lord allow it. We have nothing to fear. Greater is he who is within me than he who is in the world. And he said, and they know that. That's why they don't bother with us. And I thought, isn't that interesting? How much our thinking is developed by TV than by God's word? You don't need to fear the enemy. You can have confidence in the world of chaos that's around us. Isn't it interesting? So that's the first one. He is faithful. Number two, he establishes you in your faith. Number three, he will protect you. Here's the fourth one I want you to see here with the issue of confidence. This will blow your mind. Because we usually think in terms of ourselves and what we need to do, and we're unsure about ourselves. If you're sure about yourself, I have to question that, because most of us should not be sure about ourselves as far as how we'll handle things, okay? Look at what it says, verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now here's the final thing that he's confident about. There is confidence in the Lord that you will do what is right. That is a bold statement, isn't it? Because if I were to go up to you right now, and if you were realistic with me, and I would say, well, do you think you'll do the right thing? If you were honest with yourself, I'd have to say, if it was me, if you were asking me, George, do you think you'll do the right thing in that situation? An honest answer would be, I'm not sure. Right? Wouldn't we say that? Because we don't know. You know, it's like, you know, I've I've developed in my perspective, you know, when I think about Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, when it talks about uh, if anyone is taken and overtaken in sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in gentleness and meekness, lest you yourself be tempted. You know, I came out of that verse thinking, you know what, I need to be a little bit more loving with people when they struggle because given the right circumstances, right situation, who's to say that I wouldn't do the same thing? And the reality is, folks, you might do the same thing. So when you look at this statement, he has a confidence not in you. His confidence is in who, folks? The Lord, that you will do what is right. Because why? How can he say that about a believer? Because someone lives within you, folks. Who lives within you? I'm sorry we don't have coffee anymore, but who lives within you? Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit. Boy, I didn't realize how much we missed that coffee, right? To get that, that energy going in us, huh? The Spirit. And because the Spirit works in your life, Paul has a confidence in the Lord 
that ultimately you're going to do what's right. Now, does he, does that leave room for you to mess up? Yes, it leaves room for you to mess up. Because the Bible knows that you're going to mess up. But ultimately, you will do what is right. Isn't that a confidence here? It's not a confidence in yourself. Can you be confident in yourself? No. Hopefully you get that here. Don't be confident in you. Be confident in who? The Lord, Jesus. So then because of that, he gives us a couple of growth areas. Here's a couple of things that you really need to be focusing on as far as your growth. Because he, he shares them to us as prayer requests. These are two prayer requests that he makes that he's wanting to see you grow in. Okay? So let's look at that. We're going to look at verse 5. Two things are mentioned here. Now may the Lord, here it is, direct your hearts into love, to the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Two things that he's wanting us to grow in, okay? Number, number one, there is the desire that the Lord will direct your hearts into love. Man, it is so true today in our culture where there is just anger everywhere. And if you as a believer aren't careful, you could get caught up in it. It's real easy to get caught up, isn't it? Isn't it? But should that be true of us? No, it shouldn't be true if you're a follower of Jesus. If anything, what needs to be flowing out of your life is love. And so can we say that's a growth area? I think we can all admit that, right? We all need to grow in this area, right? And so that's what he's really wanting to see the Lord do is to direct you into love. The love of God, which, by the way, folks, can I be sure that he'll do that? Yes, because there are other scriptures that tell you that's the role of the Holy Spirit is to what? Fill you with his love to overflowing, to be there for others. Here's the second growth area. We can all agree with this one. Here it is. There's the desire that the Lord will direct your hearts into patience. I don't need help with that, George. I'm a patient person. Yeah, right. Yep. We all need help with that, right? Well, I'm not praying for that. You know what happens when you pray for that, George? Bad stuff happens. Bad stuff happens, period, folks. Whether you pray for patience or not. But I'll tell you what, as we're coming, facing the coming storm, as we're enduring in the chaos, two things need to happen in our lives. We need the Lord to direct us into love, love, and what? Patience. I think we can all resonate with that, right? So, okay, what do we do with this, George? We see that our focus in prayer needs to be God's word going out, protect us from, from wicked men, from the unbelievers. We can see what our confidence is in, that the Lord is faithful. He will establish us in our faith. He will protect us from the evil one. And what? He knows that in the Lord we'll do what's right ultimately. And so here we are. We've got to ask God, Direct us into that love. Direct us into that patience. What do we do with this? Well, it's really your choice. Okay. Think for a moment about your life. I got my, my, my life in my, my thoughts. Think for a moment about your life. Think about what it's, what's on the horizon. What's happening in your life personally. What's happening Around you, family-wise, extended family, think about what's happening in our community, think about what's happening in our nation, in our world. And, and that is overwhelming when you pause for a moment and think about that, right? That's just overwhelming. Because then you realize how much you don't control. 
And the problem is we're all control freaks. But you don't control any of that. And so chaos is a good word, right? But the choice is yours. What's the choice? Well, here it is. You have to choose to live with confidence in the Lord or to live in fear. You have to choose. I hate to say it, most of us live in fear. That's just a natural go-to. Boom. Always go to the fear. Right? Because it, in fact, I don't go to it. It comes to me. Because it already knows I'm going there. Boom, it's right there. Hi, how are you doing, friend? But you got to choose something different. you got to choose the Lord. That's how you're going to get through it. That's how I'm going to get through it. That's how we'll one day be there with him and he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because we endured. You know, the wonderful thing about the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation is at the end he gives a promise. And it's interesting to in each one of the promises to the seven churches, he says this, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. Well, what does that mean? Overcomes this life. I will do this. I will do this. And there's seven promises there that are wonderful promises. Listen, to him who overcomes. Look, overcome. But you got to choose to overcome. Why? Because your confidence is where? In the Lord, not in your fear. That's how we're going to endure. And that's how we should be praying for each other, right? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. And I am so thankful. that I have no confidence in myself. But that my confidence is in you. May that be true of each and every one of us here. I know I struggle with that confidence, Lord, because I keep wanting to naturally revert back to thinking about myself, thinking about myself, living in fear. But I thank you that even with that, you're forgiving and I can put my focus and my confidence back in you. I pray that we would do that this morning, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter the struggles that we're facing, no matter the difficulties, that you can guide us, you can direct us, and you will get us through this, just like you've gotten us through other things, until one day we go to be with you. So I ask your blessing upon each and every one here. May your word take root in their lives. May you establish their hearts in love and patience. We ask this in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Okay, guys. Um, just want to remind you, next week, of course, will be uh, nursery and uh, children's church. If you want to, we've had some young couples not come because they, there hasn't been anything. If you guys could, we'll try and let them know on our own here. But if you meet somebody, you can tell them, hey, we're starting that up again. We're taking some precautions. And, and if they don't want to at first, we understand. These are nervous times, okay? Uh, but you can tell them that we're making a step forward in that direction. Uh, of course, the Bible study this week on Tuesday mornings at 1030 and then on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, we're going to be in Lesson 5, okay? Uh, I'll be up here with my mask on if you want to talk to me about anything or if you need prayer about something, the elders will be available. Uh, but let's stand together and we'll ask the Lord's blessing as we go. And I hope you will enjoy this beautiful fall day, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather and worship you. You know the needs that we have. You know what we're facing. You know what we will face. 
Help us to have our confidence in you, no matter what happens. And we will give you praise, Lord Jesus, for you are always with us. Bring us back safely next week, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right, folks, have a great week.